Moitzi Shabbos, my friends. <clears throat> I'd like to continue talking about A.M. Hassifer. Uh, many of you don't know who A.M. Hassifer is. Professor Avrom Michal Hassifer died a couple of months ago. Uh, he was professor of statistics at the University of New South Wales. He was one of the greatest statistical mathematicians in the world. I met him in Boston in 1972 when he was um, on a sabbatical from his university. He was invited by MIT, considered then to be the greatest uh, university for technology in the world at that time. Uh, he was invited there to solve problems for its mathematical department. At that time, the professor uh, told us of a study he had gone uh, into while he was a scientist in Australia where they analyzed the results of nuclear testing. They had found millions of mutations and not one new species. And it was his job to take the raw data and to see what would happen to project it. And based upon the data, he also was able to give a very strong opinion regarding to the possibility of evolution from one-celled animals to human beings. Given the amount of changes necessary and the number of mutations that they discovered and how none of these mutations created a single new species, his projections were that given billions of years, it is statistically impossible for evolution to have ever taken place. That was his learned response. It was published in a major scientific journal. And he never received any kind of response from the biology departments. And I want you to understand it's been over 40 years since he issued that paper. There's never been a response. And the reason there has never been a response is because his equations, his statistics are impeccable. He was one of the finest statisticians in the world. He put his reputation on line with it. And the fact is, no new species were discovered. Now, I know that there's people out there that have done all kinds of discoveries and found what they could consider to be new species. But all those, those new species are what you call a speciation types. They, they, they specialize in a particular area or they develop in a certain way. They remain the same type of animal and were you to be able to commingle their um, the seed, they would create similar offsprings. It's just that they become slightly different to the point where either their food is different or the practices are different, they look a little different. And these are not significant changes when we talk about the huge changes necessary from amoebas to human beings. A.M. Hassifer became a believing person seeing the supernatural gift, the prophetic gift of the Lubavitcher Rebbe. As I told you, uh, the Rebbe sent an emissary to teach he and his family in Tasmania when the rabbi didn't even know about Jews in Tasmania. And this was at the same time that the professor was praying to God and saying, look, if Moses exists in this world, let him send me a, a teacher. Later on, uh, professor, the professor's wife, Atara, of blessed memory, went on a trip in 1970 all over the world with a girl who was spastic. She had spasms and uh, could, could fall at any time and had a very difficult time getting married. She went all over the world to discover, to find a person who, who was a fit. And I had the privilege of being at that wedding that she had arranged between two wonderful people, but who had certain physical disabilities. While she was in a private audience with the Rebbe, she expressed her husband's concern about their financial future, to which the Rebbe said, your husband will be receiving a, an invitation to a major university, and it's a very, very good offer. Sure enough, when Atara called Avram Michoel, she called him Michoel, 
he told her that he had just gotten an invitation to the University of New South Wales, and he really had to write the Rebbe about this invitation. Professor Hasofer, Mrs. Professor Hasofer, told him that she had already heard, heard about this uh, offer from the Rebbe, and that the Rebbe had already concurred there was no need to write him. On another occasion, she was going on a trip to Montreal, and the Rebbe asked her if she had housing in Montreal for the trip. She was going there to f pursue her studies about meditation, which the Rebbe wanted a new type of meditation developed that would be kosher. And uh, she was going there to visit um, someone. She said she had already made arrangements with someone who was a colleague of hers, and she knew them very well. And the Rebbe, hearing the name, says, you know, he was here about 20 years ago. And I understand that he recently published a work, and I'm surprised that he didn't uh, send me a copy of his work. Also, their daughter is in Jerusalem, and uh, there's no need for concern. She, will, she is just fine, and she will be okay. Those words were cryptic, but Dr. Sofer came to her host a, a day later and uh, told him that the Rebbe had mentioned that he had been there 20 years earlier. The host was, was elated and surprised that the Rebbe knew that he had pu recently published a work and that the Rebbe expressed concern about the fact he hadn't received a copy. Then with regards to his daughter, he says, what do you mean? My daughter is fine. She's in Jerusalem. There's no problem. As soon as he said this, a telephone came from Jerusalem. Your daughter has been involved in a severe traffic accident a few hours ago, and her condition is critical. It's imperative that you come right away. All of a sudden, the words of the Rebbe became very, very clear. The time that the Rebbe said this to Dr. Hasofer was exactly the time that she had been involved in this accident. And, um, and obviously the Rebbe knew of this and did not communicate this to Dr. Sofer, but the Rebbe said that the daughter is fine, there's nothing to worry about. And so the professor, uh, who was from Montreal, he um, kept this calm, and they couldn't understand why he was so calm when they were telling him that his daughter's condition was critical. In fact, one doctor got on, he says, I want to be very blunt with you. It is, in my opinion, almost impossible for her to survive this accident. Well, the man did not panic, and instead of going crazy trying to get a, a flight, took a flight for the next day. By the time he got there, the doctors greeted him and said, you know, there was a tremendous turnaround while you were in, in transit, and your daughter is just fine. A few days later, she walked out under her own power. Now, these are the types of things that happened to the Hasifers with the Rebbe probably hundreds of times. Uh, there are those of, the, of you out there who said, well, there's many, many stories about this. The Rebbe did this tens of thousands of times with individuals. And the fact that the Hasofers remained Orthodox Jews, despite knowing all that you people out there think you know, knowing all the things about biology, all the things about archaeology, all the things about politics, all the things about biblical criticism, they learned all of those garbage things, and yet became extremely religious and pious people and uh, very, very vociferous about it. In fact, Dr. Hasofer told me herself in 1972, she had personally gotten over 70 young men to start doing the mitzvah of putting on tefillin every single day, 70 Jewish men. And the course of her time saved thousands of young men from going into a very, very negative type of uh, Buddhist meditation in, and offered them alternatives. These people were very, very positive, very influential, and most of all, they were scientists. And their scientific discoveries have never been addressed by the scientific community out there. And whatever you say out there, the scientific community is a bunch of people who believe in themselves. It is a religion unto itself. Science is not the purview of thinking, and I'm open to thinking regardless of what you think. I am open to ideas, but a lot of what passes as science is not science, including evolution.